This is Support is Sexy, episode 24, with Warren Agency CEO, Nicole Aguirre. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am thrilled to have you here because it just would not be the same without you. So today I'm excited to tell you about our guest, Nicole Aguirre. Nicole is the CEO of Warren Agency here in New York City. And it's interesting, I met Nicole through our mutual attorney because I was mentioning to him about my desire to shift the angle of Chic Rebellion Media, which is my parent company. And when I mentioned to him what I wanted to do, he connected me with Nicole which just speaks to the power of speaking your desires to people so that you can get support around it, right? Which is what we're all about. So he connected me to Nicole, and I just have to tell you, she is wonderful, brilliant, and she has this agency that is all about empowering women to lead. But one of the things that's most interesting about Nicole's story is that's not how she started. The agency started actually, it wasn't an agency, it was a magazine. And in this episode, Nicole talks about how she had the epiphany that brought her to the realization that she needed to reinvent the brand and then what that pivot looked like. And, you know, a lot of us struggle sometimes with needing to pivot and we want to hold on to the way things originally were, but sometimes a change can make all of the difference. So in this episode, Nicole talks to us about three things tips on how to reinvent your brand to generate revenue. Also, moments to get still and get clear on what you really want. She also speaks to the power of visualization. I'm all about that. Nicole talks about how to let go of what's not working and focus on what is. Also, why setting goals is not necessarily the answer of how to move forward. And she had an interesting thing to say about that. And Nicole also shares with us why every entrepreneur needs someone that they can be real with, which is something I love because that's what the show is all about, getting the real stories of these women, how they made it, when they struggled, how they still made it happen. So I know you're going to love Nicole. One thing to note really quickly, she is a busy woman, so she is in a busy environment. So you will hear some talking in the background, people moving around because she's in the office and there's a lot of activity going on, but you will be able to hear and focus focus on her voice and focus on all the jewels that she's dropping in this episode, but wanted to make you aware of that. So without further ado, here we go. Nicole Aguirre. So Nicole, thank you so much for joining us on an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be on. Yeah. So I have to ask you the first question I ask everyone. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I think I fell in love with entrepreneurship when I realized that I didn't have to go out and get a job that I didn't want. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, when you graduate from school, you think the only option is to go out and, you know, get a job somewhere, of course, like everyone else will, or do the thing that your parents wants you to do, want you to do. Um, but in my case, uh, I graduated from school, uh, during the financial crisis in December, 2008. And so automatically, the job that I was up for, which was actually completely different from what I'm doing now, there was a, a hiring freeze. I was going to work for a North Korean nuclear proliferation expert at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, just a and- little bit different than what you're doing now. <laughs> just a tiny bit. <laughs> yes, just a tiny bit. Um, I had just moved back from living in Seoul for a year and uh, there was a hiring freeze. So that job did not happen. And it was a great excuse for me to work on the creative things that I'd always been so passionate about, but could never quite, um, or felt comfortable turning into a job. So, um, so, you know, that's when I started a magazine in DC in 2009. And so, um, I just, I just loved it. I mean, we produced photo shoots. I taught myself all about how to create a print magazine and I had fantastically talented friends and photographers to help me work on it. And I loved it. Um, to the point that, you know, I was 22, my parents were saying like, you know, it seems like you really like, they like this magazine. It seems like you're taking this more seriously than your job search. And I'm like, that would be correct. That would be right. <laughs> this is the thing that I'm doing. Exactly. I, I, I do want to do this more to more than search for jobs at 
DOD. <laughs> <laughs> now you grew so, up in DC, right? No, actually, I grew up in LA. Um, oh. I, uh, yeah, I grew up in LA, and I moved to DC to go to the George Washington University because I thought I wanted to work in government and to be a diplomat, which turned out very differently. Um, but yeah, I'm from LA originally. Now, what was Nicole like as a child growing up in LA? Oh, man, that's such a great question. Um, I was really into photography, like I am now. Um, but I was also, God, just so different. Um, I was super into photography. I was in high school, just could not wait to get out of high school. I thought high school was the lamest thing in the world. And uh, I just wanted to go to college and do my own thing. And I hated being told what to do. And um, I got really good grades, but I was just so bored in so many ways. And so I was excited to graduate from college and just go do my own thing. How did you get into <laughs> photography? Was that something that was introduced to you? Or were you one of those people who just picked up a camera and was naturally good at it? Um, my dad was always interested in photography. Um, and he has a very creative job too. He's in the music industry. So um, creative things, I think, are in my genes in general. But he was really interested in photography. He loved old fashioned Leicas. So he got me interested in it and bought me my first real camera, which was a Nikon D40. And I think maybe at the time, like a couple of years later, he regretted it because that turned into an actual <laughs> artistic career path instead of just a hobby, which I don't think he was expecting. But I have him to thank for that camera. Would you say your dad is one of your greatest influences or who are some of your others? Um, I don't know that I would say he's my greatest influence. I think that he is my mm, he's like the person that I want to impress the most, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, um, but he's definitely the, the kind of person where he, everything I do is amazing job. You know, I, I hear, I hear I'm proud of you once in a while and then I know he really means it. That's awesome. So who were some of your other influences growing up? Um, God, growing up, um, I went to a lot of art shows. So LA has a lot of art. And so we went to the LA County Museum of Art a lot. And my first art show at LACMA was a Chagall show which is just so gorgeous. And I was really influenced by that. Um, I grew up around a lot of songwriters and musicians because my dad's in the music industry. And so um, there were a lot of different musicians growing up that, that I was impressed by and uh, songwriters who are basically behind the scenes that no one ever really knows about, but who are really, really talented. So um, all those types of creative people are, I, I was influenced by. Um, I, I don't know that I would say one specific photographer though. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that uh, after college, you were planning to go work for uh, the DOD, right? And you said you went the other direction and did something creative. Now, was that something that was uh, always something that you wanted to do, actually? You were just sort of going the traditional route because it seems like the polar opposite of what you were where you were headed. I always wanted to be a photographer and work in photography in some capacity. Um but I come from a family of also immigrants and my parents speak several languages. My mother's an interpreter and speaks French, German, and Spanish. Um, and growing up, we, we learned several languages. And so that seemed like a really great way to travel the world, um, and solve difficult problems and be involved in, in world affairs and have an impact on the world. And so it seemed like having a global job was really the only way to impact the world at the time. Um, because I hadn't really been exposed to all the different types of jobs you could have. You know, mm -hmm. um, so um, from there, uh, I had a one thing that happened was I got a scholarship to uh, learn in in Seoul, a Department of Defense scholarship called a Boren scholarship. So I moved to Seoul and Seoul is such an incredible city and has incredible art and fashion and food. And um, I spent a lot of time studying Zen Buddhism in Korea, actually. Mm -hmm. And so um, that had a big impact on me. Um, and I had a I spent a week doing a solo meditation retreat with a Buddhist nun who's a good friend of mine in Korea. Um, and I just had like a deep meditative experience that ultimately led me to really change my mind about what I wanted to do in my career. So oh, yeah. I know that's like a totally left field response. No, <laughs> I love it. It's, please. I'm all about it. It sounds like it was very um, transformative then. It was, it was, it came at the right time. It was absolutely transformative, um, and it led me to where I am today. It was the first step to doing a 180, to doing what was truly in my heart, what was going to be right for me, versus what I should, in quotes, should be doing, or what other people wanted me to do. Right. Do you think it was the idea that you were in Seoul with the Buddhist nun, meditating, and all of that being clear, and having that opportunity that gave you that clearance, or just is that something that anyone can do, you think, anywhere, and sort of 
getting still and stepping away from what you think you're supposed to do and, and looking at what you really feel you should be doing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you don't need to find like the top of a rice paddy to, right. <laughs> you know, to, right. to find that out at all. Um, anyone can find that. I think it's about having moments to, like you said, to be still and to really ask yourself what really makes you happy outside of the constant influence of other people. So I think if you can step out of that, uh, find some silence and really have a conversation with yourself, you can discover that a lot more easily. Now, when you came back and decided that you were going to do the magazine or create something, have something creative like that, when did you know that it was a business? Like, this is that thing that I'm going to do. Was it as soon as you started or was there a point where you sort of had the light bulb moment? So I didn't. So I started like, like, you know, I started my my creative career with this magazine um, and I did not mean to start it as a business at all. I was not concerned about how money, how much money it was going to make, which mm -hmm. I should have been, but I was not at all. I was only concerned about, um, the look and feel and ha having this, bring this thing into the world and the challenge of figuring it out. Like, how do I design a layout? How do I even start with a printer? What kind of paper do I use? I have no idea. So I was just really interested in the creative challenge of it. And I wasn't planning on starting a business in my mind. I was starting this magazine and maybe I was, and I was, you know, still going to apply for jobs in government probably on the side and then just see what happened. And really this magazine just took over my life. And, uh, also no one in government hired me. So that was good. <laughs> that was, it sort of worked in your favor for sure. Yes. So now you have an agency called Warren that works with women leaders. And what yes. exactly does Warren do for the women that you work with? Yes. So officially, we are a mission-based creative agency that empowers women to lead. Um, we are a full-service creative agency, meaning we do everything from naming companies, branding, content creation, to um, a lot of content production. So that might be like a big photo shoot or a video spot um, for a campaign, all the way to web design development um, and also ad creation and camp running campaigns on social like Facebook ads. So we're really a one-stop shop for different types of companies. And then the spectrum of companies that we work on are everyone from um, funded startups. So we're working with two companies right now that are Shark Tank alumni, mm. um, both founded by two women each. So that would be a startup, let's say it's just, just getting started, or maybe it's a few years old, has raised money um, and needs help with rebranding or a uh, packaging design, or let's say like doing a, a campaign that's going to get a lot of attention for their company so they can increase sales, things like that. Um, all the way to working with, we work with a lot of nonprofits that are focused on empowering women in various ways, um, or that are led by women. So we've worked with Michelle Obama's, uh, the partnership for healthier America on her let's move campaign last year, doing a video spot that we called adult recess, um, all about keeping a recess in schools. Um, and then, uh, we've also worked, we also work with big fortune 500 companies. So Marriott is a company they're working with now. Um, and the way that that relates to our mission is that we're working with a very visionary, uh, general manager of one of the Marriott hotels to help, help them sort of relaunch and, and reposition that hotel after, um, a big renovation. Beautiful. No, sorry, go ahead. So just the spectrum is, you know, we work with female founders or we work with women who are leading teams within bigger brands, or we work with organizations that are, that their mission is to empower women or are working on, on that right now. So we, we just started working with uh, a nonprofit that we just signed on with last week. And we're working on a video that is focused on homeless youth and teaching them about, um, teen pregnancy. Hmm. Now, why was it important for you to create a brand that or, or how did it shift to a brand that really focuses on women leaders, empowering women and that kind of thing? Well, uh, we are a women led company. As, hello, you are talking to the founder. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, we're also a uh, highly majority run um, female company. So almost all the women that work all the people that work for us are women. Um, not exclusively, but most of them are, I would say 95%. Um, and then, you know, there, the reality is that there are so many creative agencies out there, especially in New York. There, there are many, but women are still a group of people that need a lot of help in the sense of you don't have the same opportunities right now for fundraising. Um, a lot of women are starting companies, but on average, most women run and owned companies only get to about a hundred thousand dollars in revenue on average, which is super low compared mm -hmm. to, um, male run companies. 
um, the likelihood of a woman getting to a million dollars in revenue in their company is just so much lower than it is with the, for a man. And uh, when I found out that statistic earlier on in my career, I thought, well, you know, we can actually put our creative services and brains and, and help specifically to focus on women to help them have a larger piece of the pie essentially in business. And then hopefully those women, after we help them, they will pass it on and they will hire other women. And then, you know, women will have a larger role and, and stake in the economy. And, and then that helps everybody. So ultimately when women do better, everyone does better. And we just really wanted to focus on that um, because it's what we believe in. It's in our, it's in our hearts and we know we can make a real difference. One female led company at a time. I love that. I love that. It's in your heart. It's in your DNA. It's just part of what your company is all about. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that in the hard times, like, you know, this running a company is so hard. You know, there's so many ups and downs, emotional ups and downs. Sometimes you ask yourself, why am I even doing this? It's so hard. Um, but if you have a greater purpose in why you're doing something, you are not going to give up. You're going to keep going even when it gets hard versus when you ask yourself, why am I doing this? And you don't have a good reason. It's so much easier to give up. So true. So true. Now, one of the things uh, you mentioned sort of is that you reinvented uh, Warren from being the print magazine to the agency. What was it that yes. made you make that? You and I have talked about this a little bit, but what was it that made you come to that decision? I was going to run out of money. Right. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Yes. Right. Um, when I said that I had not thought about that when I was running the magazine, um, you know, eventually I turned... 24 and my family was like yeah about that job money thing you might want to figure that out now and I was like yep you're right yes right. I'm, I'm you know I was doing freelance work I was doing freelance writing I was doing freelance photography and, and that sort of thing but um I hadn't figured out exactly what I was going to do for my career and I didn't yeah. have a full-time job so I probably at the time had about two or three months of runway in the bank to pay my rent and I needed to figure out what I was going to do next and it was either shut down this magazine go get a job somewhere, which to me sounded like my worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. I loved the magazine. I did. I couldn't think of a job that I wanted to get anywhere that was better than that. So I just said, okay, well, I know that the brand that I've built in this magazine has value. What can I do with this? What can I turn it into that can make me money immediately and that can allow me to continue to work with the people I'm working with, continue to do the type of work that I'm doing in terms of writing and photography and, and design and an agency was the obvious answer to me. So that's what I did. Awesome. And what's the first step you took towards making that transition or reinventing your, your business other, after the decision to do so? Um, I wrote Warren established March 28th, 2013 on a post-it. And then I put it on the my computer screen. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Seeing it first, so visualization. I'm all about that. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I did. Um, and then the next thing I did was I called up one of my clients. I had a photography client that I was working with, which was that had hired me personally to shoot their photography after they'd seen the work in the magazine. And so I called them up and I said, Hey guys. Um, so it's, it's not Nicole Aguirre that's going to be doing your photography anymore. It's Warren. And they were like, okay, whatever. Okay. Right. As long <laughs> like, as you're still involved. Exactly. I don't care what you call it as long as you're still doing this. Um, and that, and they ended up being our first client. And then slowly by, by proving ourselves, we got to do more and more work. So, um, our first ever client was Ann Pizza in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we shot photography for their H street location. And then, uh, you know, I said, well, Hey, why don't we do it for the U street location? And then, you know, we proved that we could do that and then it could look fantastic and that we could have an influence on the overall creative direction of the brand. And then it turned into, okay, why don't you do all of our social media content? And it just became one thing after another, um, of us also really hustling to, um, get people to understand, Hey, yeah, you know us for this magazine. Well, cool. Now we also have an agency. <laughs> nice. I love so that. Getting the word out about that. And tapping into the context that you already had, you didn't just throw those aside and say, oh, now I have to start over with another group of people who want an no. agency. No, 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 no. I mean, that's why I kept the name Warren. Right. When I, when I started the magazine, I named it that knowing that this is going to be a fashion and photography magazine. Never did I think that this is the name I was going to keep for my future career. Never. I probably wouldn't have named it that. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, but I, you recognize, though, that you had that brand equity there already, right? And it wasn't because I think sometimes people think to start over, you have to scratch everything and start fresh. 
Not at all. I mean, the thought crossed my mind, should I change the name? But no, there was so much brand equity there and recognition that there was the smart thing to do is to keep that. And also, over the four years that we'd run the magazine, we had built up a 5,000 person mailing list. Mm. So we could tell people right away, hey, this is what we're doing. And then say, you know, do you know anyone that needs help or like promote that right away? So that was a huge leg up for us. Um, I It's hard for me to imagine doing it with having no contacts. You know, I, I, I already had that built in, which is mm-hmm. very helpful. There was a period, though, where you tried to do both, right? You tried to have the magazine and the agency. Was that obviously that didn't didn't work out for the best? You decided to make a full transition? Yeah, I did try to do both. And to be honest, I, I thought I could do both. I wanted to. I really I was very attached to the magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the business people in my life would say, you know, you should shut down the magazine. Like you really can't do both. And I just had every argument for why I had to do both. It was hard to let go, right? It was so hard to let go. Absolutely. I thought I was going to disappoint people, you know, and um, we just had the whole community who loved it. And it was, it really more than, than the community, it it was part of my identity. Mm. So it was really hard to let that go. And eventually the decision was made for me because we got so busy with the agency that from a business model and from a financial standpoint, I couldn't justify spending the time and money to produce something that wasn't going to bring in money in return. So I just had to let it go. Right now, what would you say based on your experience are three tips or three things women entrepreneurs should know when they're considering reinvention? Because I think that's something a lot of us struggle with, not wanting to let go of something that may not be working or that may not be working right now. That's what I try to tell people, too. Maybe that's not working right now. And if you move toward this other thing, something will open up for or not, but at least being open to it. So what would be your three tips? Three tips for people who are considering reinvention? Yes. Okay. Um, I would say... One is do everything you can to see the situation from a new perspective. Um, If you've already been running a business in a certain way, you are going to have a hard time seeing it any other way than the way that you know. So I would explore alternative points of view, talk to other people, think of different scenarios, write down, you know, doodle and write down different graphs showing all the different perspectives um, and try to get yourself out from where you are. That's the first tip I would say, mm-hmm. try to see it from a different way. Um, or ask friends, you know, if, if this were you, what would you do differently, you know, and try to find different steps that you take. Um, number two is decide where you want to be in a certain amount of time. So if you have been trying something and it hasn't quite been working the way you want it to, which might be a reason why you are considering reinventing, um, think about where you'd like to be. And so maybe that is a revenue number or maybe that is um, doing something full time or whatever that might be for you. Um, I would think think about how you might get there and think about how to eliminate all the things that are going to stand in your way. Mm -hmm. So it might just be, as it was in my case, that trying to do both, you will be standing in your own way. So if I kept doing the magazine, I would have stood in my own way of being successful at the other thing because I would have been taking that time and energy away from that. So um, be realistic with yourself about whether you would be standing in your own way or anything would be in your way and, and, and be ruthless about it. You know, maybe it's a certain person that you're working with or maybe it's like a who knows what it might be. Just really try to zero in on what are those obstacles and how to eliminate each one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third one for reinventing reinvention, gosh, it's so, it's so hard to, <laughs> to remember how I felt back then. Um, the third one is do not underestimate yourself. Mm-hmm. You are capable of so much more than, you know, so sometimes I think that goal setting is good because it drives you to a certain thing. It keeps you focused. But on the other hand, sometimes I try not to set really big goals because I, I think I'm going to surpass them. And so I don't want to limit myself, you know? So people say like, well, what's your five-year goal? And I'm like, well, I could, I could tell you, but I'm probably capable of so much more than that, that I don't want to, I don't want to limit myself. So your goals are kind of a limitation in some ways. In some ways, mm-hmm. yeah. If I if you would ask me um, the year I started the agency in three years, would I be where I am now? 
I would have probably told you that I'd be at half the place I am at now because mm-hmm. we have moved so quickly and um, I underestimated, you know, how, how quickly we would pick up speed or, or who I would meet that would influence the success of my company. So I would say, don't underestimate yourself and assume that you can do twice what you think you can do. Awesome. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier, too, is that you have business people in your life or people that you talk to. I don't know if these are coaches or what have you, but I would imagine that was important, too, to sort of step outside of your yourself and say, OK, what should I do? Or for them to come to you and say, oh, maybe you should let this go for now. Yeah. Oh, gosh, this has been so influential in my life. Um, so my now husband mm-hmm. is was really my my first mentor years ago. And he owns an agency now. Um, So when I started to get into the business of running an agency, I had such a leg up because I had somebody to ask, you know, what do you do about this? And what do you do about that? And like, I need this contract. Like, what do you do? Or just, I was able to ask him so much. And I'm sure I drove him crazy early on, like asking him (laughs) a thousand questions a day. Like, what do I do about this? But I had someone to call. Right. Um, And that was even early on before we even started dating and eventually got married. But, um, that was so important to me. And that relationship changed over time, you know, because I needed a lot of help early on. And then over time, I needed less and less and less help until now. He's like, you don't even need me anymore. Right. <laughs> what can I do to help? I yeah, it. I'm like, I'm like, no unsolicited advice. Okay, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Now, did you so, guys meet through through? Um, were you looking for a mentor at that time? Or did it just sort of happen? And you were open to it? And he was open to it? Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for a mentor at the time necessarily. We met through friends and we had known of each other and I really respected what he built from a business perspective. And so we were friends for almost about a year, um, during, during this process of me starting the business. So, um, so yeah, I wouldn't say it was formal. It just became, we were friends and then he was the person I would go to for business advice. And then eventually we started dating and kind of mixed those two things, um, which can get complicated, but it has not worked out has more of the pros and cons for sure um right. and we were, a- were able to set lots of boundaries to kind of to navigate that very well actually um until now i'm at where i am today and i need a lot less help and now we kind of just you know share share stories and support each other as much as we can i love that a lot of the entrepreneurs that i've talked to have said that their mentor sort of came about in different ways not necessarily them going after them or one person i talked to she did ask someone to be her mentor and the person basically was like your mentors find you which basically meant no i don't want to do it you know so it's it's interesting to hear the same with you it sort of happen and then you develop a relationship and admire the person's work and ask questions yeah i mean we didn't call it that we didn't formalize it that way it just became I just became this is the person I asked questions to and they're willing to, to talk to me. And um, I think formalizing it could be intimidating for people. I think just saying, like, could I email you occasionally, ask you some questions? Yeah. I think most people would say yes to that. Love that. So, um, Sorry, go ahead. And I was going to say I have a lot of uh, – female friends and founders who I meet with occasionally when they need advice when something's happening and they just say, hey, can we get a coffee? And we'll be very candid with each other about what's happening in business and kind of just share information. In that way, that could be mentorship too. Right, exactly. That's And that's actually very important to have a space where you and another entrepreneur, especially another woman, can be open about what's really going on. Because a lot of times, as I always say, especially in the world of social media, everyone wants it to look glossy and slick and perfect, but there's always something gritty going on. Yeah, I think you that every entrepreneur needs somebody who they can be real with, mm-hmm. you know, not someone who they need to talk to and constantly impress or talk about their highlight reel. They need someone that they can go to and say, I think I'm going to run out of money in two months. What the hell do I do? Right. Like, you know, they need somebody they can be real with and they can that can bring real solutions or that can um, tell them the truth. For sure. Now, speaking of telling the truth, tell us about the effort events that your company puts on. What sparked that idea and, and what are they? Nice segue there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You so, set it up for me. So Effit is all about female leaders and entrepreneurs telling real stories of challenges that they've overcome in their careers and the lessons they've learned in the process. So a couple of years ago, I read Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and it had such an influence on me. I thought he was so brave and being so candid about 
how to run a business when there are no answers, when all the hard things are happening that no one talks about, like you're about to go to business, you got to fire your friend, just things that are really hard. So he was so candid about it. And after I finished reading it, I thought I would love to read the version of this book that a female CEO wrote. And I want to hear a woman's perspective Mm. about running a company. And I looked for it and I realized there wasn't one. It didn't exist. And so then it occurred to me, wow, there are so many women out there who are leading companies, leading teams. Um, They have so much business advice to get to share, but they're probably too busy being in it to even write books about this. So how about we pull them in while they're in it? to actually share this advice with us and other young women who are transitioning to a different career, who are thinking of starting a business and can really use this real advice that they have a hard time getting in other places. So we started this event called Effort, and the whole point of Effort is it's named that because it's, it's supposed to be in your face and, and real. You know, like we don't sugarcoat things. We don't dance around things. We don't talk and take no action. Like Effort, just do it. Let's just say it. You know, let's be real. So um, what we do is we every, every time we do Effort, which is about every two months between New York and D.C., we invite three to four female leaders or entrepreneurs. This can be anyone from someone who owns a small business to a chief marketing officer of a major company. Mm-hmm. And we invite them to tell a 10 minute personal story of some kind of challenge that they've overcome in their career and how they got through it. And the whole point is for them to be extremely candid and personal about it. Um, before each, before each effort, I get on the phone with each lady and I ask them to tell me my, their story and then they do. And then I say, that's great, but let's get into the real nitty gritty details here. Right. <laughs> Um, it, probably, it and, starts off clean, right? But then you get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And the more we do it, the more that uh, that women know exactly what I'm looking for. And they're willing to be candid because they want to finally have an opportunity to just tell the truth and not act like everything's great all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to get on stage and say, you know what? Let me tell you about the time I got fired right. and how I got how I got through it. You know, because they know that this is a safe place to be able to talk to other women in a very real way. And it's almost like cathartic for them to be able to do that. So um, the next one is on Wednesday in New York City on July 27th from 7 to 9. And we're expecting about mm, 150 to 200 women. It's going to be a packed house. Um, and this one is called F It, Show Me the Money because mm-hmm. it's specifically focused on money. So women are going to be sharing their money stories when it comes to business in their career. I love that. Now, the next one, there's a link that I can put in the show notes, right, for people to find out about future events because this will go up after that because you said you're doing them yep. every other month. That's right. So um, it's on our website, warn.nyc forward slash community. And every single time we do Epic, you can go on there and you can RSVP. The event is completely free. So all you have to do is RSVP and come on down. Wonderful. I'll be at the next one. Can't wait yes. to check it out. Awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Awesome. So now if there's one thing you wish someone had told you about entrepreneurship, what would it be? I wish someone had told me that I wish somebody had defined entrepreneurship for me in high school. Mm. It's such a long, intimidating word, you know, (laughs) that I wish someone had said in high school, entrepreneurship means that you start your own company with your own dream and your own vision. You work for yourself, you make your own schedule and it comes with risks because no one's guaranteeing anything for you, but you get to make your own future. If someone had said that to me in high school, I would have said, sign me up right now. Where right. do I sign? You know, but no one, no one did. And what's ironic about that is that both my parents were entrepreneurs. Mm. I just didn't know that's what that meant. You know, my father ran a music publishing company. My mother ran an interpreting and a subtitling company. And I knew that they worked for themselves, but this concept of entrepreneurship wasn't really explained to me as an option you know only like the safe traditional careers were explained to me as an option so i wish someone had said that and i wish someone had said like an entrepreneur is not like a a white guy in a suit right briefcase you know right 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 (laughs) that's not what that is here are some examples of people who are entrepreneurs and and what you can do so i wish someone had told me that was an option early on because um i started my sort of started my company quite early but i might have done it even sooner it's very interesting, too, like you said, that both of your parents were actually entrepreneurs, but you still were thinking, and maybe they were thinking, too, of you going the traditional route. Do you think you mentioned earlier that because they were immigrants that they sort of made their own way and it was just, I'm working, they didn't think to label it as entrepreneurs? Where's your family from originally? Where are your parents? Uh, uh, 
absolutely that's the case. My dad's from Argentina, uh, from Buenos Aires, and my mom is from Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And they both moved here as immigrants. Um, my dad got a, a visa through a lottery system. Mm -hmm. So he just got lucky and got his citizenship. And my parents were married. And so my mother, many years later, was also able to get citizenship. But it didn't happen right away at all. Um, so they were just trying to get by, you know, and, um, my mom, my dad ended up, he worked in music for a while. So he, he came to the United States to work for a record company called BMG, which was a very big record company at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but even then it took time for him to, to become a citizen. So, um, for them, you know, they'd come so far that they were just thinking, you know, how, how can we use our skills to get creative and, and have a career, which is entrepreneurship. Isn't that awesome? Exactly. It's but, so you know, crazy. Yeah. I, I, most immigrant parents don't want their kids to go through that same journey. You know, they want them to have stability. Um, my father always wanted to be a diplomat. Um, but the way that that works in Argentina, in Argentina, all the colleges are free, except for the one that you have to go to to be a diplomat. Mm. That, that you have to pay. And so people that come from humble backgrounds, they can't go there, which means they can't, their, their path to that sort of prestigious career is blocked. Mm -hmm. So he always wanted to do that. Um, and when I expressed some interest in that, you know, IP was completely supportive and encouraging and really wanted me to do that. I think dreamt of me doing that. And I ultimately wanted a different direction, but it took me a while to kind of change gears and figure out what was going to be right for me. Right, awesome. Now, what does your support network look like now in your business and otherwise? Sure. Um, so I, well, one, I have a fantastic team of women around me at Warren who are incredibly supportive. We are a team and we love what we do every day. Two, um, I am a part of a group called Dreamers and Doers in New York City. That is a group of, I would say, maybe now like a thousand women entrepreneurs. And um, we all support each other in through conversations and events, um, we get to have very candid back and forth and, and, and just support each other in terms of resources and PR opportunities and all different things like that. And so that is, um, that is wonderful. Is that a private um, group, a private organization? Um, it is a public organization um, that you can just Google Dreamers okay. and Doers I'll, and I'll um, you can check that out. Okay. And then um, there's a bunch of other groups. So I'm part of a group called Summit Series that is a private group um, that you can apply to be a part of. That um, It's not just entrepreneurs, but it's many entrepreneurs, a lot of creative people really at the top of their field from around the world. And they get together for things like Summit at Sea um, and uh they get people together in Utah for different types of retreats. And so I've met a lot of people through that. I would say the other people in my support group, besides group like groups like Dreamers and Doers and Summit Series, um, are other entrepreneurs. And that would be, um, you know, women at other agencies, women who own other companies. Um, my husband still, who's an entrepreneur, um, those people understand what it's really like to be on this journey of entrepreneurship and understand the emotional highs and lows and, you know, the not necessarily having time for everything that we'd like to. So having that network is really important. Awesome. Now, what's the greatest lesson having a business has taught you about yourself as a woman? Oh, it taught me that I'm a badass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> um, I did not always know or believe that, but man, it's taught me that I am strong and uh, so capable of greatness, which you know, I, I just didn't give myself enough credit before. And I'm not afraid to, you know, like toot my own horn about this because I've gotten so much farther than I ever thought I would. And I know now that, you know, my, my dreams then were even small. So I'm so excited for what's going to happen, you know, 10 years from now. I turned 30 this year and people are like, oh, it's like terrible. You know, you're 30 now. I was like, hell no. Oh my gosh. I'm great. I'm so happy. Things are great. You know, like I work for myself. I can, you know, I can support myself. i I feel great. You know, I'm, I'm doing the things I, I wanted to do. So I feel good about it. That's awesome. So what's next for you? What are you most excited about today? Um, what am I most excited about today? Um, we are hiring again. 
which oh. I'm really excited. Which I'm really excited about. Um, we're going to bring another full time person onto our team, which is going to be great. That's always exciting when when you're growing. Um, we're doing F it on Wednesday, and so we're stoked about that. We're going to have um, Geisha Haas, who is the founder of Dreamers and Doers, actually going to be telling her money story. Um, and then also on Friday, I'm going to be shooting a lookbook with Bloomingdale's, great. and we work. Yep, they're doing a collaboration to highlight the modern working woman, which is Bloomingdale's' October theme for fashion. Um, and they have graciously invited me to be a part of it. So I'm excited for that shoot. I love it. So you still t- get to do it as a photographer or, or do your photography? No, I'm going to be a model. <laughs> You're going yep. even better, Nicole. That's great. You're going to be yeah. featured in a lookbook. I'm like, oh, you get to shoot it. That's great. Oh, I love it. That's wonderful. Everyone has to look out for you. And that's coming out in the fall. Yeah, I think that's going to be out in October. It's going to be um, uh, on Bloomingdales.com. And they will potentially be actually images in store. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. So thank you so much again for cramming us into your day. I know you're very busy. I just have a few last things for you. Absolutely. And wrapping up, if you think over your life and your career and you had a chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Oh, man, now you're going to make me cry. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just one person? One person. Over my whole career or my life? God, that's such a hard question. I know. It's 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 one of those kinds of questions. Your career or your personal life? And if you had the chance to thank one person, who would it be and what would you say? I mean, I would have to thank my dad. I would absolutely have to thank my dad because he never told me that there was anything I couldn't do, which is huge. You know, he gave me every opportunity he could think of as whenever he could do it and made so many sacrifices to make sure that I saw the world, um, lived in safe, beautiful places, bought me cameras to be able to, you know, stoke my talent, um, and has been incredibly supportive the entire journey of my career and has always believed in me. So I would say my dad. I love that. It's beautiful. So now how can we support you? I'm going to have links to the website, going to have links to Effit and all the other great things that you mentioned. But what's a way that we can support you following you on you guys on social media and the great things you're doing? But what else? Um, That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Of course. Um, That's what we're all about. You can. Well, there are a few things you can do. One, you can come to Effit and support the women who are telling the stories and, and be open to telling your own story. Um, about your career and the challenges that you've overcome. Um, two, um, you can get in touch with us if you have a project you'd potentially like to work on together, something that we can help on, whether it be branding or content or launching a campaign. So if you have a business you need help with, we can help with that. Um, and number three, I would say you can help us on our mission by supporting other women yourself mm-hmm. by hiring them to do different jobs by um, buying their products, by being real and having honest conversations and giving advice to other women, by pulling other women up with you throughout your journey and your career. So you can help us in the, and us, I mean you and me, Lane, and all women um, by helping each other and having that be a focus of your day and your life um, at all times. Awesome. Now you said that people can get in touch. Is that to go to the website and go through the contact page if they're interested in working with you guys or hiring the agency? Yeah. If if you're interested in working with us, you can go straight to our website, uh, warn.nyc, and there's a work with us button right there on the homepage. Um, You can email me. Um, My email is nicole at warn.nyc. Or you can follow us on Twitter. We're at Warn Creative. You can, you can, Come meet us in person. Come to Effit sometime and just have a conversation with us there. Any of those ways. And we love to hear from everybody. We're super responsive. Um, so please reach out. We would love to hear from you. I love that. Now, it's okay if I leave your email in, right? I always ask people that yep. just to make sure. Okay, good. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, awesome. So again, thank you so much. I'm so glad that we were connected. Speaking of being connected through people who see two women, you know, trying to create something special. I'm so glad to have been able to meet you. And I can't wait to go to the event. Um, So last thing, just 
a parting piece of advice to you from you to our listeners? Um, I would say that the I, I would give the advice that our event gives, which is F it. Just just do it. You know, there is no time in life to be afraid. And just if there's something that you really want to do, go out there and try it. The worst thing you can do is it doesn't work out. You try the next thing. So I would say be brave, go out there and try things. Um, and don't don't let your life go on, you know, wishing you had done something or admiring somebody else's life from afar. Like, go make that your life. I love it. Nicole, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Hold on for one second, okay? Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm Absolutely. so happy to be on. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to my website, elainefluker.com slash podcast. So that's E-L-A-Y-N-E. F-L-U-K-E-R dot com slash podcast. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.